Hello and welcome to the ZSL Wild Science Podcast. I'm Moni Böhm and I'm a research fellow at the Zoological Society of London's Institute of Zoology. Now, let's not beat around the bush. 2020 and the start of 2021 as well, they've been, I mean, feel free to insert your own favorite expletive here. For the sake of this podcast, I will go with, they have been quite unsettling. Now, we're in the midst of a major global pandemic, courtesy of a zoonotic disease, COVID-19, a disease which has jumped from animal to human and which has caused a huge and tragic loss of life. The burden on our health system has been enormous, as has the overall economic fallout of this pandemic. Now, this pandemic really is unprecedented for many of us in our lifetime, and I reckon I am not the only one wondering, how can we do things better in future to prevent this happening again? Now, as we humans increasingly disturb our planet's natural habitats and convert them to agricultural or urban areas, the way we interact with wildlife around us also changes. And that potentially leads to more contacts between us and animals carrying pathogens, such as bacteria or viruses. So today we will be discussing the links between ecosystem degradation and infectious disease outbreaks. And although I spent some years in my past thinking about wildlife disease, I'm a bit rusty now. So I have enlisted the help of some wonderful guests to help me navigate this big and topical subject. So my first guest is Rory Gibb. Rory is a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and his research focuses on how environmental changes impact ecosystems, human health, and the burden of zoonotic and vector-borne disease. Now, he previously did his PhD at University College London, and he also did his master's project all those years back here at ZSL, right, Rory? Yeah, that's right. About six years ago now. <laughs> oh, that's six years ago by now. That's insane. Um, I'm just really glad that the saying nobody ever really leaves ZSL kind of still holds. I mean, it's not an official saying, but, you know, it does feel like it. Anyway, let's talk disease, because that sounds like fun talking about disease in 2020. We haven't done enough of that yet. Tell me about your PhD work. In a nutshell, you've looked at how land use change has impacted ecological communities, right? Yeah, so I'm really interested in what the environmental processes are that cause zoonotic diseases to jump from wildlife into people. So we call that spillover. So what I'm really interested in understanding is is how human induced changes to the environment. So that's things like land use change, climate change, deforestation, urbanization, how those change the communities of wildlife that carry zoonotic pathogens and how that can impact how humans come in contact with them and the likelihood of these kinds of spillover events happening. So people getting sick from coming into contact with with wild animals. So the work that I did in my PhD was focused mainly on looking at land use change and on trying to understand whether land use change globally is having you know, clear and detectable effects on ecological communities in ways that could influence disease risk. And have they? Yeah. So we know land use change is one of the major drivers of biodiversity loss worldwide. So human changes to the landscape damage habitats and they change the kinds of communities of species that live in an area. And what we find in general is that more sensitive species, species that are not so good at coping with human impacts, tend to die out quite quickly from disturbed ecosystems. But there are other species, more hardy or resilient species, that we find that will tend to persist or will even do really well in areas where there are lots of people. So I guess you can think about things like pigeons and rats as being, you know, like a good example of that. And so what we found is that worldwide, when we pull together information from loads of ecological communities, that those species that tend to be more likely to, to persist in, in human dominated landscapes, so this is like agriculture or cities, those are the ones that are more likely to carry more diseases and the ones that are more likely to carry human diseases. So effectively, we're kind of changing the landscape in ways that are that's kind of changing the hazard for zoonoses to potentially make the jump from wildlife to people. Now, there are lots of other intervening processes, if you like, between a wildlife community with a disease and a human catching a disease. Like there's all sorts of socioeconomic factors that determine whether people are likely to actually come into contact with wildlife. There's all sorts of factors related to whether those populations are stressed and whether, you know, pathogens can transfer more easily if populations are kind of immunosuppressed because of different types of stress. And those are kind of factors that we can't necessarily factor in or they're really hard to factor in and they might be specific to a particular place at a particular time. But what the work that we did can show is that there's, there is a kind of general effect on ecological communities that makes them appear to be more hazardous in more human dominated environments. So kind of less 
hosty species are, are kind of dropping out at a higher rate than more hosty species. <laughs> what, what do you mean by less hosty and more hosty? I like I like the terminology. <laughs> That's actually a really good question. And it's something that it's not very easy to define. And I think one of the challenges for this kind of work is that we still don't really have a good handle on what makes a species a, a good host of pathogens or, or a good host of zoonoses. And there's a whole host of <laughs> a whole host of research that's being done on that question at the moment. But it's really difficult to define easily because there's all sorts of different factors that determine you know how good you are at carrying and transmitting a pathogen so what we did was to think about a couple of measures of hostiness and they're quite simple measures if you like they're whether a species is known to carry or be a reservoir for zoonotic pathogens so do we know that it's a reservoir for human pathogens and then there's also how many pathogens do we know that that species carries so those are two kind of quite simple uh, measures that we can use to kind of proxy for how you know likely we think that species is to be carrying lots of pathogens or to be carrying human pathogens but it's a really complex picture and that's definitely an imperfect measure and i think going forward there's a there's a big kind of open question about how we do a better job of predicting what species are particularly good hosts and, and what are the species traits that make them really good at being hosts that's a really important emerging area at the moment i also really want to know if in any of your publications you called it hostiness because <laughs> i love that so, so actually, um, in a in a paper by by a collaborator that is currently in in the process of being written, he used the term hostiness kind of as a joke, or because I've said it a lot, and I suggested that it's probably not a good idea to try submitting that to a journal because I'm Aww. I'm not sure that they'll, I'm not quite sure that they're going to take the idea of hostiness particularly well because it's such an ill-defined concept. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for the purpose of our podcast, it's absolutely perfect. I can tell you that much. So I suppose hosts or species with more hostiness than other species, they will obviously respond different to land use change. And you already alluded to that. So does that mean that where we have particularly human dominated landscapes, we're essentially losing some of these lesser hostiness species, so the non-hosts, and thus our chances of getting in contact with those species that are really good at carrying disease and passing disease on are increased? Is that how it works? That's effectively how it's working, yeah. So that's that's the kind of general picture. But I suppose that general picture that host zoonotic reservoir species are more likely to persist, whereas non-reservoir species are more likely to decline in response to these kinds of pressures. There's a lot of complexity underneath that general picture, and that relates to the kinds of groups of species that we know carry diseases. So what we found is that generally Generally in kind of agricultural and urban systems, the, the species where we're tending to see this pattern, this divergence between host and non-host species, it tends to be it's rodents, it's bats, it's passerine birds. So a certain subset of species. And we already know, for example, that a lot of rodents are quite good at coping with human disturbance. Whereas when we look at a group like primates, they tend to be pretty sensitive to human impacts overall. And actually, we don't see a clear difference really between host and non-host species there. They, they tend to kind of universally decline in response to increasing human pressure. So I guess what that means in terms of disease risk is that it probably depends on the kind of disease, the kind of host and the kind of landscape that you're in. And so it's actually it's a much more complex picture than just human dominated landscapes make more disease risk. It's more like human dominated landscapes change the kind of underlying pattern of hazards that could give rise to disease risk. And they're certainly doing it in ways that appear to be predictable and generally not good. But it's kind of quite a complicated picture when you start to look at it more closely. Oh, I can imagine. But also that means you're, you're kept in a job, right? That's, I guess, the idea. <laughs> <laughs> So for your work so far, have you looked at any particular diseases or at a whole range of diseases? Yeah, so the this work that I've been talking about just now, this was taking a very broad kind of pan-biodiversity, pan-disease approach. So really thinking about the full spectrum of zoonoses that wild species are known to carry. But a lot of the work that I've done around that has been focusing on more specific diseases. So I did quite a lot of work during my PhD on, on Lassa fever, which is in a way a really good example of a disease that tends to respond by increasing it in more human dominated landscapes so it's carried by a, a rodent that's really common in, in west africa and that tends to do really well in in kind of agricultural systems and again a couple of other diseases i've been focusing on more recently it's an interesting tick-borne disease called crimean congo hemorrhagic fever that's a mouthful yeah isn't it just and we call it CCHF because it's a little bit easier to um, yeah. to swallow. Yeah, so that's transmitted to people by ticks, but it's maintained in nature within wildlife communities. So effectively, 
when people and livestock get bitten by infected ticks, then you can be infected with virus. But, you know, the factors that really determine the likelihood of being bitten by an infected tick relate to the landscape. They relate to the kinds of host species that are present there. And and finally, I'm also, my current work is mostly focusing on dengue fever, which actually, it, it is zoonotic in that it has an animal origin, but the outbreaks of dengue fever that we see worldwide are mostly driven by transmission from person to person. And though the transmission occurs via mosquitoes. So... Again, it's thinking about wildlife species that are intermediaries between people, in this case, mosquitoes. But obviously, it's quite a different scale and they're quite different to, say, rodents or primates as disease carrying animals. Yeah, there's so many different ecologies of different species to take into account as well, which is just mind boggling. So from what you've found out so far in your research what do you think that means in terms of how we can help safeguarding human health in future, while also safeguarding wildlife, of course? Yeah, so it's a really big question. And I think that's kind of the question, really. So after the start of the pandemic this year, the, the IPBES, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, they pulled together a panel of experts in, in disease ecology and human health the, the kind of interface between between wildlife disease ecology and human health to develop a kind of report looking at pandemic risk and, and environmental change. And that's one recent output of a long body of research that's really thinking about how is it possible to reduce the human footprint on landscapes in ways that both benefit wildlife and benefit human health in terms of reducing disease risk? The answer might often be really complex and because of the complexity of all these different disease systems means that, you know, there might there may not be a kind of one size fits all approach. You know, it might not be as simple as stop deforestation and we stop, you know, the emergence of new diseases because there are so many routes by which these kinds of diseases emerge. So I think there's a couple of things that stand out as being important questions but or important things to do one is kind of more from a public health side and it's really thinking about how can we use ecological knowledge so understanding of how wildlife communities are responding to climate change to land use change to do a better job of targeting healthcare and surveillance for diseases so basically how do we kind of improve health systems in places where there's particularly high risk of zoonotic diseases either emerging so new diseases emerging or whether it's kind of existing diseases that are a really major burden on, on people's health and you know so one of the, the major things that can be done is is to improve health systems in these areas where, where we think that the ecological risk is really high then there's also the kind of other question, which which is obviously really important. How do you kind of reduce the risk of these things happening in the first place? And and that comes down to, I suppose, a question about is it possible to manage landscapes and, and ecosystems in ways that kind of maintain the, the sort of ecosystem regulatory functions that help to keep all of the populations of these species in check while also providing what we need from ecosystems. We obviously need to produce food, so we need agriculture. And so it's not as simple as saying, well, don't grow food in these areas yeah, because don't eat. That's, yeah, no, yeah. that's not that's not gonna work. So the big question is how do you think about what the trade-offs are and, and how do you how do we move towards developing kind of maybe landscape level interventions or land management that can help to reduce disease risks and provide, you know, say crop yields? And that's a really important question and it's gonna really depend disease to disease, but it's kind of at the core of, of this idea of planetary health that's been talked about a lot in the last few years. So I suppose maybe with the current pandemic and everything that 2020 has thrown at us, do you see that this might become like a a much bigger focus now? Essentially, my question is, what's your take on 2020 and how what we might have learned from it? <laughs> yeah, I depending on what day you ask me on, I've kind of got my optimistic hat or my pessimistic hat on. And I, I think that, you know, my optimistic hat says, well, a lot of people researching emerging diseases have been saying for years that these kinds of big outbreaks and, and surges in new diseases are going to happen and we need to be thinking about how to prevent them and also how to prepare health systems to deal with them better and so in as much as this has been a really big wake-up call you know hopefully one of the positive outcomes of this awful year will be that it will be higher on the agenda and just the question of really trying to, to understand more deeply what the kind of true contribution of things like environmental change are to the risks of these things happening um, because I think there's a lot we don't know so I think if it helps to sharpen priorities into understanding that that feels like a really good thing 
I guess my pessimistic hat says the kind of original agreements on climate change were pretty much, you know, made over 20 years ago now, probably more like 30 years ago. And we still really haven't seen much movement on that, even though we're seeing more and more wildfires, we're seeing more and more extreme weather events, we're seeing, you know, really devastating impacts that are kind of disproportionately affecting people in more vulnerable and poorer parts of the globe. And from a kind of governmental institutional perspective, it feels like there's an awful lot of ability to kind of put the blinkers on, isn't there, and not really engage with it because it's not in, in the current interest to do so. And I guess my concern is that once the vaccines are rolled out, that this becomes just another problem in the past rather than something to think about in the long term. Because I think the real question here is climate change is accelerating and mitigation activities aren't proceeding fast enough. So there are going to be a lot of strange consequences and challenging consequences of climate change and land use change, which are going to include diseases. So adapting to those is really important and my hope is that there have been some lessons learned here but on on my bad days i i kind of think well is it going to be like every other environmental and health issue and kind of disappear down the priority list it's kind of how i feel i think this is how many of us feel just when you started mentioning climate change again and i suppose this year we've been so absorbed in this pandemic day-to-day scenarios and day-to-day kind of news that we're getting but obviously there's also been a lot of climate change related news this year i mean there's been like one massive wildfire after the other and in many ways i hope it's been a pivotal year where we we got this wake up call on many levels i'm like you i've got good days and bad days and i'm not sure what day it is today for me yet <laughs> no, I, feel I haven't had enough coffee yet to establish that <laughs> yeah it's it's challenging I, i can see positives in terms of what's being talked about but it's just all too easy for those things to disappear from the public eye very quickly especially the achievements of uh, the scientists that have developed vaccines in you know an astonishingly short period of time is just incredible i mean like scientifically speaking it's just such a huge achievement and it's amazing and it's a really positive sign in terms of being able to mobilize the technology we need to in order to deal with these kinds of huge outbreaks when they occur which is amazing but in a way it doesn't answer the bigger question of well how, how do we do a better job of protecting people's health in the first place that these kinds of events are less likely to happen rather than just dealing with them when they do occur it's thinking about you know what what can we do to try and stem them earlier i guess one of the things that i've found interesting about being where i am now which is somewhere between kind of global health epidemiology and ecology rather than being solely in the kind of ecology yeah. and conservation world is that you also see the massive achievements of a lot of global health initiatives in terms of yeah. reducing people's disease it's easier to kind of see the kinds of success stories that keep you going in the public health and epidemiology world than than there is in the conservation world i think that that's a tougher one <laughs> It is, but there are also good stories in the conservation world. Can't think of one off the top of my head, though. But that vaccine development literally is insane. I really hope that people widely appreciate how amazing that achievement is. <laughs> yeah, I know. I want, it's interesting, isn't it? You kind of wonder, you know, if you're not kind of keyed into it, maybe because the rhetoric from governments and things has always been like, oh, we'll have a vaccine soon, which has always been like a massively optimistic perspective from a governmental side, because it's quite possible it could have taken way longer than it has. Yeah. So maybe actually that has downplayed how incredible the achievement is in a way. Yeah, I worry about that a little bit, because then obviously, you know, the average person in the street will be like, oh, finally, they got around to doing that. <laughs> And it's like, finally like, would have been in 10 years' time. Yeah, yeah precisely. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. Okay, so my next guest is Christina Faust, who is a research scholar in the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics at Penn State University in the US. Now, her research focuses on understanding how environmental change affects infectious disease dynamics, and she has a particular focus on diseases that can impact humans and domestic animals. Christina has researched the transmission of lots of different pathogens, and we'll hopefully talk about a few of them in our little interview. Anything from parasitic worms in Uganda to bird flu in the US. Hi, Christina. Hello. Hi, thanks for talking to us. Let's start with the basics. How are different diseases transmitted? I suppose in the context of the current COVID pandemic, uh, we're by now probably all familiar with aerosols and the like, but not all diseases are transmitted this directly and via airborne routes, right? That's correct. So we often think of diseases being transmitted either directly through aerosols or bodily fluids or indirectly. And this is either through the environment, so you can pick it up on foodstuffs or in the soil, or through another organism like malaria is transmitted through mosquito vectors. 
there's many different ways in which you can get a pathogen. It just depends on which parasite or pathogen you're thinking about. And are you looking at a particular type of pathogen or are you, are you working on, on all sorts of different ones that are transmitted in all sorts of different ways? So throughout my career, I've worked on many different ones. At the moment, I'm working on a virus that circulates in bats and spills over into horses through their urine. So it's they urinate while they're feeding um, over pastures and the horse eats the infected pasture and gets infected. And then an infected horse can infect a human. So there's a little complicated transmission process that goes on there. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. Where are those bats? So this is in Australia, oh, on cool. the east coast of Australia, mostly in southeast Queensland. Um, and it's a new emerging infectious disease called hendrovirus. It first was detected in 1994. And there's been sporadic cases here and there. Cool. Excellent. Oh, with an interesting horse vector. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, so it's all horse owners and veterinarians that get infected. So there's yeah. this really high risk with horse ownership. Wow. So it's quite easy to target who's going to get it. I mean, 2020 is doing nothing. And And this interview is doing nothing to make me more at ease. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Well, the good thing is, is that only around 20 people have gotten it over okay. 20 years. So it's not as infectious as COVID. So it's not transmitted as easily through aerosols and things. Good. And I mean, I shouldn't, I shouldn't worry too much. I'm A, not in Australia and B, neither do I have a horse or am I a vet. I suppose this year we've all become a little bit more disease literate than we were just about a year ago. I suppose we know that minimizing contacts is vital for limiting disease transmission. So when looking at these diseases that occur in wildlife and can spread to humans, where in the landscape do these contacts happen? Yeah, that's a great question. So it depends kind of what ecosystem you're talking about. But we often think of when humans are starting to come into an area, potentially their contacts with new species increase, particularly when they're doing activities like cutting down trees in forests or collecting trees for charcoal or going out and doing bushmeat hunting. So these are really high risk activities that potentially put you in contact with new infectious diseases. And these are typically the focus of a lot of these emerging infectious diseases diseases. But then, as we all know from COVID, another huge risk factor is bushmeat trade. So once you bring those wildlife to market, and then you have a huge density of people potentially contacting the same source population. So both of these are really important to understand and kind of quantify over time. So your research looked at what impact habitat conversion has on disease outbreaks. Now that sounds like a really amazing question, but how do you even go about studying that? Yeah, so it is a complex interaction of many different things. But over the last hundred years, people have recognized that following an increase in land conversion, we often see new diseases popping up. And so on a global scale, it looks like land conversion is correlated, so associated with with the occurrence of new diseases. And I've been more interested in on the ground and especially in tropical regions where we have really high rates of human population growth and really high rates of conversion. So 6% deforestation a year. So this rapid turnover of the landscape. And so what did you find in your research on how, how does habitat conversion impact disease outbreaks? And how can we learn from this to maybe help us you know, avoid the next pandemic? Yeah, so I think a lot of people are now familiar with disease models and the, the magical R0 number. Yeah, we so are. <laughs> so we were using these mathematical models to look at when you change a landscape, how much human populations change. So you have growth of human populations and a subsequent decline of animal populations. And then at the same time, we also are changing contact rate. And we think this is related to how much edge there is between human habitats and, and forest landscapes, for example. And so as you start to deforest a landscape, you often see more and more edges between forests and human habitats. And that actually helps facilitate either contact directly with primates, for example. So there's some really nice examples in Uganda where that's happened, or that um, mosquitoes are more likely to leave the forest and go into someone's house when they live right next to the edge. So we think this edge is a really nice proxy for human and new wildlife contact rates. And, and so we model that over time and space. And it looks like intermediate level. So after you've converted 40% of a local landscape, that's when your disease risk is highest because the animal population is declining, but your contact with that population is still quite high. 
and you have enough humans in that landscape that even if spillover is only occasional, you have a high likelihood of actually leading to an outbreak. And we think that's what happens with things like Ebola. So Ebola needs enough people in that village and enough contacts with potentially infected bushmeat or, or maybe bats. We're still not sure of what the actual reservoir for Ebola is, but it needs the enough people and enough contacts to lead to that successful spillover, we call it, to a successful transmission of a new pathogen to a new host. So there's, I suppose, from a disease perspective, this kind of sweet spot between how many people are in this area that I'm operating as a disease, how many wildlife hosts and how high is the level of contact Yeah, we definitely them. think so. Because a disease spreading to a new host requires a lot of chance events that typically shouldn't be happening. Mm. Um, these diseases have evolved a long time with their own host, and there's many barriers that have to be overcome. The infected animal needs to be in the right place at the right time and has to have an infectious contact with the human. So there needs to be lots of things kind of aligning at the same time, but it happens quite frequently. We have many emerging infectious events, but we also have so many people on this planet and things like deforestation are happening at a really rapid rate. So although it's horrible, the amount of diseases that have emerged, sometimes I think we're fortunate that we haven't had more problems. And maybe we have had more diseases emerge, we just don't detect them. People go to the health clinic with a fever, and it's not known to be a new pathogen, really. Probably COVID was circulating for a long time before it was recognized as something new and weird. So in an ideal world, what should we learn from research like yours? What should we do at a kind of well, at our human level to kind of ideally combat disease outbreaks. Yeah, so I think research like this suggests that protected areas, so where you have a really nice pristine habitat where wildlife are able to thrive and grow and kind of have their own set aside place is actually hugely valuable, not only for conservation, but we also think for human health as well. So having large protected areas seems to be a good win-win for conservation and human health. On the flip side, in areas where you don't have protected areas, we think that increasing health capacity, so local health capacity to be able to get people access to basic health care and recognize certain tenets of new diseases emerging. So I think Uganda has done a really good job in this in that they've had several Ebola outbreaks. So when someone comes to the health clinic with a hemorrhagic disease, this is automatically notified at a national level. So they're quite good at controlling outbreaks as soon as they happen. And so building more capacity at that local level is really important. And maybe using what we know based off of satellite imagery, we can actually detect where we have large amounts of deforestation and targeting healthcare capacity growth in those areas. So if you're thinking about a new place that's being deforested, it's often a new population. They don't have an existing healthcare system. So helping build in these healthcare systems and access to healthcare, we think is an important part in addition to conservation of those resources in the first place. Oh, well, this is fascinating. Usually I just talk about how we can prioritize conservation, but now we're also talking about how we can prioritize spatially healthcare systems. That's amazing. But when you have healthy people, it's also beneficial for conservation, right? So I think sustainable livelihoods is quite important. So People talk about this as a one health perspective, so that ecosystem and human health and animal health are all interconnected. And I think it is a difficult thing to get on board, but I think a lot of communities are well aware of their livestock health is quite important. And trying to integrate this into conservation objectives is a nice move forward, especially when there's diseases that are transmitted between livestock and wildlife. And an easy next step is that humans can get new diseases as well. Okay, so my final guest is Kimberly Fornes, also from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she is Assistant Professor of Spatial Statistics and Epidemiology, I'm very impressed with that, at the Centre for Climate Change and Planetary Health. It's quite a mouthful, isn't it, Kimberly? Yes, it is a lot of words. <laughs> it is a lot of words. So your research focuses on the role of landscape on the transmission of infectious diseases. And you're using all sorts of cool technology, such as drones and satellite tech, to monitor changing environments. So thanks for joining us, Kimberly. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So first of all, let's start with what I just read about, the amazingly named Monkey Bar Project. What's that all about? 
Yeah, so the Monkey Bar Project, Monkey Bar stands for a very complicated acronym that none of us can ever remember. I love that name, by the way. That made me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a real problem for us because it's also the name of a bar in Kuala Lumpur. So people would like look up Monkey Bar when someone came to their house and to take blood. And, and then they would find this bar in KL and, you know, kind of be like, who are these people? <laughs> like, where have they come from? <laughs> but basically it was a multidisciplinary project and um, looking at the emergence of the zoonotic malaria plasmodium nolzi. It was focused in Malaysia and the Philippines and included partners from the UK, Australia and other countries, looking at really what was driving this increase in zoonotic malaria risks. So zoonotic malaria risk, or zoonotic malaria first of all, is that something like monkey malaria? It is, it's often called monkey malaria or malay, it's malaria monyet, but um it is types of malaria which are normally carried by monkeys. So in this case, it's macaques, usually long-tailed and pig-tailed macaques. But this type of malaria can be spread to people when a mosquito bites an infected macaque and then goes on to bite a person. Cool. Excellent. I'll just remember it as monkey malaria. That's much easier for me. <laughs> so we've been talking about changes in landscape, particularly, I suppose, in the parts of the world where monkey malaria is prevalent, deforestation, I suppose. Is incidence of monkey malaria related to deforestation? Yes, that's really been the focus of our project. So we've been looking at why we've seen this very sudden increase in the incidence of human cases of monkey malaria. For Plasmodium nolzi, it's been known about for a really long time. So it was identified in the 1930s. And there was only one case that was reported in a person. And it was quite a bizarre story in that it was an American working in the Malaysian jungle at night, apparently surveying, but I think actually spying on the Russians during the 1960s. And wow, he came that is a weird story. <laughs> yeah, he came down with this type of malaria and they sent him to Walter Reed Hospital and diagnosed that it wasn't a normal human malaria, but it was actually Plasmodium nolzi. So that was the first and only ever naturally acquired human case until 2004. And in 2004, colleagues identified that there were actually hundreds of cases of this type of malaria that had been misdiagnosed. And every year since 2004, we found more and more cases, particularly in Malaysia. Cool. And so your, your project focuses on figuring out if there's any relationship between habitat change and the incidence of this disease. And I think you're doing this by playing with a lot of cool technology. I heard drones... I heard radio callers. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yes to all of the above. So we've really hypothesized that what was driving this sudden increase that we're seeing in human cases was that monkeys and the type of mosquitoes that transmit this and human settlements in much closer proximity. So we think deforestation is bringing all these populations that were previously separated closer together. And so to really understand how habitat is impacting human risks, we've used a lot of these technologies. So we've done GPS tracking of macaques, but also GPS tracking of people to see where people are moving through during peak mosquito biting times. And then we've also been integrating these types of data onto really detailed maps of landscapes. So to use satellite and drone technology to map landscape changes as they happen. So to actually follow deforestation and look at how this impacts how macaques and people are using space. So what have you found? I mean, I find the link between the guy who got monkey malaria by spying on somebody and what's going on here quite fascinating. <laughs> It's a really interesting story. There's a great backstory to Plasmodium nolzi. When they first discovered it in macaques, they actually tried to use it as a cure for syphilis, which obviously didn't work. So they'd shown that it could be spread to people because they infected a number of human prisoners that were actually in the States at the time, in the kind of 1930s and 40s. So yeah, it's got a crazy medical history. Like, I did not expect you to say any of this. That's a really cool backstory. But let's go back to your spying on macaques. What have you found out? What have you found out where macaques go and where might these contacts happen between people and the mosquitoes, for example? We've found very, very strong associations between deforestation around a village and increases in the numbers of nolzai cases from that village. So often it's the villages that have some quite patchy landscape, so there's still patches of forest remaining. And when we look at where the macaques are and where the mosquitoes are and where people are moving into, what seems to really be the most important is these forest edges. So where transmission is likely happening is these edges of the habitats where all of these populations are together. So for this type of mosquito, it mainly bites at night. 
So we're kind of looking at early evening movements or when macaques are roosting. And we can see actually that people are kind of moving into these habitat edges around these mosquito biting times. And macaques can actually move quite close to human settlements. And particularly in response to deforestation or clearing, they'll move even closer to human houses. So you are tracking macaques and you're tracking humans. How do you know where the mosquitoes are? Yeah, we haven't found a GPS collar we can put on a mosquito yet. Well, I mean, at least that way it can't move anymore. You know precisely where it is, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's where I tagged it. It's still there. <laughs> Yeah, so we've, um, but what we've been doing is we've been trying to do some really detailed mapping of mosquito habitats. And then we actually do these overnight catches where we have people sitting outside waiting for mosquitoes to land on them and, you know, waiting to catch the mosquitoes so we can actually count how many mosquitoes are biting a person in a night and what types of mosquitoes they are and how likely they are to be infected. So there are people who are mosquito catchers. Yes, we have a job description called human bait. Human, what's human date? Bait, as in mosquito bait. bait. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it for a second date and I was like, well, it's not very romantic if you get bitten. <laughs> Human bait. Is that actually how you advertise it? Yes, it is actually. So we um we have a number of different catches we've tried to use. So people sleeping in tents and then we use a net to catch the mosquitoes that come to the tent. Or we actually have someone standing with the torch looking at someone's leg waiting for mosquitoes to land. So yeah, lots of different catching methods and lots of different ways to try and identify which mosquitoes are in which habitats and which mosquitoes are by which populations. That's absolutely fascinating. There must also be so much fun is probably not the right word, but well, yeah, no, let's use it for the sake of it being my kind of level of language. So much fun to try and figure out which method works and which one doesn't. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think using all these different data types and trying different things, it's quite cool and it's quite exciting. So we actually had an MSc student who went out to the forest to kind of do her MSc project as part of like a student project and identified a totally new species of mosquitoes that had never been described before. So there's there's a lot in these environments that is new and, and really, you know, exciting and not well known. So were you ever human bait? Yes, I was, in fact. And I got very severely criticized for my lack of attractiveness. So I'm <laughs> just not really sure how I feel about that. But apparently the mosquitoes don't like me. I actually at some point went in to see a friend of mine who gave a mosquito talk and you could see if mosquitoes liked you and they loved me. Oh, I got right. a, I got a little badge, mozzies love me or something. Well, we might have a job for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> so how do you think your findings can be applied in the field? What can we learn from them? I think there's a lot to learn about how deforestation and other landscape changes may actually lead to these increases that we're seeing in zoonotic diseases, which is something that's obviously very topical and quite important. I mean, one of the things we really want to think about is how we can conserve landscapes and if there's impacts on human health, so how we can design land management to actually protect human health. But the other Thing that we've seen is we've worked very closely with the Malaysian Ministry of Health. And because we found these very clear environmental patterns, they're increasingly using environmental data in their disease surveillance. So if there's areas where deforestation is ongoing, that's one of the things that leads them to survey an area for malaria or to do all these uh, malaria receptivity studies. So it's actually directly incorporated into some of the national guidelines, um, which has been really exciting for us. Oh, that's cool. So that's like a zoonotic disease early warning system based on habitat change or deforestation and stuff that you could kind of envisage coming out of this. Yes, exactly. So to think about where you really target disease surveillance. So where do you look for the next disease? And obviously that's something that's quite important. That's very cool. So so where next for you with your research? So we're still doing a bit of work um, in Malaysia and the Philippines, but increasingly we're really looking at other diseases. Um, so looking at Ebola spillover in West Africa um, and a number of other zoonotic diseases from wildlife and trying to think about how we can use some of these data sources and approaches to understand what's driving spillover risks and transmission. I get the feeling that you might be quite popular at the moment. Yes. With that kind of research. <laughs> really get the impression that people maybe this year might be listening a bit more. I would hope. Yes, yeah, certainly. <laughs> 